thing for this. Okay. So Tom DeChilo, welcome to Utah Valley University. Thanks. Guys, we got we've actually got a really group big group here, maybe about forty to fifty people. Everyone, how'd you like the movie? <laughs> Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, really honored to have you. It's a wonderful film. Thank you. Um, and just, uh, you know, really expresses a lot of my own personal feelings about this industry that we work in <laughs> and all of the joys and all of the madness. Right. Um, it's just really a great, a great piece. Um, and it's a great one to show to film students who are uh, just kind of starting out and getting to know things. How, so, can you just give me an idea, like how, how long have, have people been studying? How, what year are the students at? Uh, we got a variety. We've got seniors. We've got uh, people just starting out in our program. We've got people probably who aren't majors but are taking some film classes and just uh, a wide range. And some you, some of them have probably been on a lot of sets before, and others never have. Okay, good. So good, good variety, I think. Um, and they'll they can tell you that when they come up. You can feel free to ask. Okay. Um, so you know, I I know a lot about this film just from studying and stuff, but most of the students probably don't. And this film came about through uh, through some hardship on your part. And I know you've probably told this story a hundred times. Uh, probably more than a hundred times, uh, but I'd love, if you could share that, um, that'd be a great. I think. I think actually the that that the maybe lessons learned in that process are probably well worth sharing. Okay. Well, <laughs> you're right. I mean, it is a it is a kind of a long story. I will try to give you the abbreviated version of it. Okay. Ah, uh, you know, I got out of film school and. Um, went on a detour of shooting films for people uh, and studying acting. And, and it was actually eight years after I got my degree uh, that I actually made my first film, which was a film called Johnny Swade. And you know what it took to get that, to get that film made was, was uh, just the most massive endeavor that you could imagine. And even to the point that when I met an unknown actor by the name of Brad Pitt, who, who literally came in and auditioned for me, uh, my producer said to me, you're not casting that guy. And I, I, I said, what are you talking about? This, this is the guy, you know? He says, you're not casting him. Uh, he's, a, he's a fucking nobody. This is what he says to me. And uh, I, I turned my back on $500,000, which, which was a lot of money in 1995, especially shooting on film. I turned my back on this guy and walked away because I knew that Brad Pitt was the guy. And I also knew that he was going to be a star. Uh, I eventually made the film. Yeah. So, you know, that miracle, that first film miracle happened. Uh, you know, there was so much potential for the film. It, it won the best picture at the Locarno Film Festival, which is a very nice festival in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, it got a lot of nice press. Harvey Weinstein and Miramax picked up the film for the United States and immediately decided to sit on it, which he did for about a year and a half because the persona that Brad played in the film, I know, I know this is going on, but it does lead to where I'm going, <laughs> okay? The persona that Brad plays in Johnny Swade was very, very different than the persona that people fell in love with in Thelma and Louise. And so Harvey Weinstein at, at Miramax at that time didn't know how to sell the film. Ultimately, long story short, the film was released in the United States in about two theaters, and, and it died in about a week and a half. So my first feature that I had spent about five years trying to make came and went in a week. <laughs> uh, it made the making of my next film really, really difficult. My next script had already been written. It was called Box of Moonlight. It was all, you know, everything ready to go. Uh, as a result of what happened with Johnny Swade, I couldn't get the money. And uh, I spent about four and a half years, five years, trying to, to make that film. And I suddenly realized that it was never going to happen. And when I realized that, uh, it was this combination of homicide and suicide, which is a really, that they should come up with a term for that. I don't know what that would be, but, and I was so 
in such a fucked up place, you know. And my wife's cousin was getting married, and she invited us to the wedding. And uh, I went there. I never had a martini in my life, and in the state I was in, I had three of them. I was, I was, I was so drunk, I was blind. I was literally speaking above of the, above their vows at 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 the at the uh, you know the, the ceremony. And out of nowhere, this guy comes up to me and out of this haze, and he says to me, "Hey, man, it's you don't you remember me? I, I, it's it's Ryan from this acting class that we took." And I, and I did, I did, I recognized him. And he goes, "You're so lucky, man. You know, you made you made a movie, Johnny Swade, lights, camera, action." And that's what he did. I mean, he did that right in my face. I told him, "Shut the fuck up." I said, <laughs> You know, you don't know the first thing about what it's like to make a movie. I said, you know, there you are. You could have an actress that's that's ready to to do a scene, and and she's emotionally primed, which is the most rare thing anyway. You know, and, and and next thing you know, the camera screws up, something happens, and you don't get it. I said, making a movie can be the most tedious fucking bullshit you've ever been through in your life. And right then was when I had the idea to make Living in Oblivion. It just hit me. And I, I didn't conceive of the entire film. What I conceived of was this idea of a series of accidents that that not whether intentional or not intentional but 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 aborted this this very fragile process that making a film is anyway and and and, and the miracle was that that Catherine Keener was was staying with us when I wrote it I, I literally went home from the wedding and wrote the first half hour in about three days uh, she was staying with us and I gave her the script hearing her laughter was was just the most amazing thing I have ever experienced and and we made a vow to each other that we were going to make this film no matter what at that point it was a half an hour film and and that's how it started we we raised thirty seven thousand dollars in about a week uh came up with, with about a five day shooting schedule and shot the first half hour and that's how it all started and then you and then just well I don't know how um I feel like I should stand like over here or something. Um, so then you built on it from there after you, uh, you, you. Well, it, you know, I was mean, it ever? Did you did you not think it was going to be a feature at first, or did you? Yes, build? I, I, I definitely did not think it was going to be a feature. I, I shot it on sixteen millimeter, which I, I'm not putting it down in any way. But my first film was shot on thirty five, and you know, you, you going back to sixteen millimeter. What was was a was a real adjustment, and I said I just said fuck it, I'm going to do it, and I said I'll make a half an hour film. What happened was that I realized that most festivals have no idea what to do with a film that's a half an hour long. They they like twenty second films, they like two minute films, uh, anything longer than that they don't know what to do with. And 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 also on the fifth and the final day of shooting, the cast was coming up to me really depressed, saying Tom, you know. We should. This is good. We we all knew that something had happened. We knew it. Um, and they said, "Well, we should do something. Yeah, you should make a feature." I'm like, "Yeah, right. How the hell am I ever going to do that?" You know. Uh, so I I started shooting the film to, to some distributors, just thinking, "Well, maybe I will gauge some interest from them to see whether they would be interested in helping me finance it." Um, and that kind of went nowhere. And I decided that what I was going to do then was I said, you know what, the only way anybody's ever going to see this film is if I write a part two and write a part three. And I didn't know what part three was, but I, I, I felt that I learned something about these characters in part one that enabled me to write part two. Um, there was a relationship that seemed to be forming between Nick and Nicole. There was a relationship that was forming between Wanda and Wolf, you know, and 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 I, you know, listen. What I had set up in part one was the fact that the reality was in black and white. That's to me what 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 the filmmaker's reality is. The actual moment of filming is is just has always been to me so miraculous that I I made it in color, you know. 
so then I said, well, okay, in part two, look, what would happen if I switched that, you know? Um, and that gave me the idea to think about this scene that they were shooting as a kind of semi-Hollywood, old, you know, 1940s, you know, costume drama thing. And and that's where I came up with that. And I, I knew definitely in part two that I wanted to have a scene where the lead actor and the director get into a fist fight. I, I felt that that was, <laughs> that it was crucial. Um, and, you know, and, I, and it worked out. I wrote part two. And then, you know, I said, well, what the hell? You know, what am I going to do with part three? And I was really freaking out about it. Uh, I was sitting there talking to my wife, and she said to me, well, listen, part one is a dream. Part two is a, is a dream. Why don't you have part three be a dream sequence? And I have to give her credit because it was such a brilliant idea. Uh, it immediately made me think of a dwarf who, <laughs> who tells the director to go fuck themselves. Because how, let's face it, how many films have been seen in which every time there's a dream, there's a dwarf walking around? In it? You know? I'm telling you. The line, the line where Peter Dinklage says, you know, even I don't have dreams with dwarfs. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You see, he actually came up to me and thanked me for, write, for writing that. You know, he said he has never had a dream with a dwarf in it. Anyway, uh, how it ended up getting from the finished script to the screen is another miracle. And, and it goes back to my wife's cousin, whose wedding I went to. Uh, no one would, would agree to finance it. No one. Um, and uh, there was this one guy who wanted to come on as a producer. He said he was he was going to recast the roles and all this shit. Uh, and I was on the I was on the phone with him, and my call waiting clicked in, and it was actually my wife's cousin, this woman Hillary, who was actually in the film the place the, the script supervisor. Yeah. What's that beeping sound? <laughs> uh, at the last minute, I'm not going to believe it. I mean, it's just kind of a sad story because her father had just died and left her for some time. And she said to me, listen, Tom, you know, I was thinking, would you mind? That's the way she put it. She said, would you mind if I find the rest of this? I, 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 second, I was on the phone with this, this asshole from all over. I said, you know what? Go fuck yourself. I hung up the phone with him. That's how he financed the film. And that's how we got it made. So it was a miracle. Yeah. I think I think any independent film getting made pretty much is a miracle one way or another. I would agree with you. Yeah. I would agree with you. You said one thing a little earlier. You you alluded to something that you also said in another interview that I that I watched um, about accidents and part of the filmmaking process and the the uh, the the how things happen on accident. Can you uh, talk a little more about that? You have some theories on that that I'd love to hear. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that, Dwayne, because I was thinking about it. You know, I mean, I've lived with the film since 1995 in some way or another. You know, and and I started thinking about well, why, why will what will I talk about tonight? That's that's different because you know, I, you know it's a different time for me, and I've had the ability to look back now and think about it. And that word is so crucial to this film, uh, accident, and in so many ways. Uh, and what I was thinking is this: film is different from theater in the sense that when you walk into the theater, you already innately. Now what you're seeing has already happened, probably at least a year old, if, if, if not even maybe three years old. So the, the chance of anything really surprising happening right at that moment is completely gone. Whereas in theater, even if it's a really, really terrible play, right, and you know, most of them are, uh, it, there's always a chance that someone's gonna get a heart attack and die right in front of you on the stage. You know, I'm sorry, I, I, that's the way I feel. That's the only thing that sometimes keeps me interested in a play, right? <laughs> so, 
what's crucial for film, and I, and, I, and I stress this to every writer and director that's there, and actor who may be there, is that the idea of accident is the most crucial thing to, to film because you have to have the feeling that whatever is happening in front of you is happening for the first time. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't prepare. It doesn't mean that, that you don't have really carefully written dialogue that seems like it's, it's, it's careless and, and, and loose. What it means is that the actor and, and, and as the director, what you do is you introduce an element of surprise for the actor in every moment. If the actor doesn't do it themselves, you do it for them. You, you, Busti Busemi is the most incredible example of that. Uh, I would just go up to him before every take and just whisper something to him, only something that he could hear. And it, he would then use it so the other actors had no idea what he was going to do next. He also didn't know where he was going to go because the suggestion that I gave him kind of threw him out of his preparation, so to speak. And what it means is like everyone in that room right now, I'm sure, has had the feeling of, of let's say, walking on ice or something, and you slip. Magnify that moment of slipping. And what you have is exactly this accident idea that I'm talking about. Because in that split second that you're slipping and trying to recover your balance, that's reality. There's nothing fake about it. And no matter what you do, no matter whether you look awkward, whether you look graceful, no matter what, that element of surprise will just explode on the screen and people will see it and they'll respond to it. Uh, now I say that because most of the time, uh, I, I sometimes maybe think of my films as well, uh, most of the time what is happening in front of the camera is by far less interesting than what's happening 10 feet away. <laughs> it's, it's for some reason, it's true. And, you 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 know you you can be filming a very intense scene a very intimate scene and 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 some, sometimes i will look and there's you know someone sitting over there you know eating a hot dog and the way they're eating the hot dog is more interesting than what is actually being filmed and and partly that's as a result of what i'm talking about uh, as a director you can really get caught up in the idea that it has to be the way you see it and 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 you need to what what your goal is is to force everyone to do exactly what you see, when in reality the way to get there is kind of the opposite. You suggest to people so that their imagination gets going, and once their imagination gets going, there's the the gifts that you get from that are so invaluable you couldn't even write them, uh, and and most of the time it's that sense of accident. There's, a, there's that great story of Brando. Uh, uh, it was, I think it was in On the Waterfront. Yeah, it's a glove, right? Yeah, and, and, and another one too as well where, where he was in a scene and he just, he dropped his keys. And says, so what'd you do that for? I said, well, because I, you know, I just wanted to do something so that when I reach, I didn't know, I was, you know, how would I reach down and pick them up? It was, it was that element of, I have no idea what's going to happen. And, and I think that in particular is crucial to film. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. I've got a question that kind of takes us in another direction, and then I'll turn it over to these guys. Uh, just because I'm curious, I'm always interested. Uh, your your uh, films interest me because of this. Um, Jarmusch has done this. Uh, you remind me of Wim Wenders this way. I see a lot of uh, musicians showing up in your movies. You know, you had Nick Cave back in the day, Elvis Costello. Um, I'm thinking of... Um, and, and I recently saw, um, through Matthew, uh, I think you recently restored your NYU thesis. My first film, yes. Right, which dealt with that, with the same sort of issue. So for you, what's the connection to these uh, rock and rollers that I keep showing? Well, it was well and Johnny Swade, of course, is, uh, is right. uh, all about that. So, anyway. It's interesting that you asked that, Dwayne. Really, it's an amazing question. Uh, if I wasn't going to be a filmmaker, I think I would be a musician. There's, there's something very, very similar about the two. Uh, the big difference for me is that I can pick up my guitar and just play it and I don't have to wait five years for someone to, you know, give me, give me the money to play it. But I have felt that uh, 
there's something about the musician's ability to, like I said, deal with accident, to 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 start somewhere and then go somewhere different. Uh, uh, a musician, not every musician. I mean, there are many musicians who literally play by the note. But, but uh, there was something about Nick Cave's character that really, really interested me. And uh, I like non-actors in that sense because, you know, listen. I think that that there are some really, really amazing trained actors. There are. I mean, what their what their gift is is that they can make it look effortless. Uh, if you can get someone who's not an actor and, and, and in another way, what, what happens with them is that this baggage, this, this performance crap that you want to try to cut through with a, with a, with a steam shovel, you know, uh, is already there because, uh, they're, they, they, they don't have the preconceptions as to what, what acting is. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate that that I had Nick be in the film. Uh, although he <laughs> he scared the hell out of me because on you know on his day on his when he was shooting he we were <laughs> I had designed this this giant white wig for him to wear. His his persona in Johnny Suede was that of kind of like an albino Elvis. That was his character. Hmm. And we hired a wig expert, and this wig expert was. <laughs> Had completely lied to us and did, didn't know anything about putting on a wig. And and on Nick Nick Cave, who I had such enormous respect for, you know, he he really intimidated me. Uh, on his first day of shooting, he doesn't he, he's in the makeup area for three hours, and I finally go back in there, and he's sitting in this chair, and this this makeup expert is poking at his forehead, uh, at the putty on his forehead where the wig hits his head, with a plastic fork. And the look he gave me was, oh my God. I swear, I, I mean, he, he, he looked like he was going to kill me. Like he, like he was, like he knew he should never have taken the film. You know, uh, uh, my job at that point as a director was to somehow keep him from walking off the set. Uh, uh, you know, these are the things that go into making films, which I'm sure you know, Dwayne, uh, that, that you never learn about them. You never study them in film school. Uh, um, you know, how I dealt with that was, was so formative for me in terms of uh, dealing with issues uh, in filmmaking. I would have to say that if, if there was a ratio between, between creative and crisis management, <laughs> I think crisis management is a little bit higher than creative, especially when you're making an independent film. Absolutely. But I love musicians and, uh, you know, uh, I love music and, and uh, it just, there's somehow, though, I think film is one of the most musical of, of the arts, actually. Well, it's great to see, you know, because it's kind of it's kind of fed your whole body of work. And so it's nice to see that interest kind of coming into it, which is, again, a good thing for students to know, whether it's music or something else. Uh -huh. I'm turning the time over to them. They're going to come up. They're going to tell you their name. And ask your question. And whenever you start to get tired, just say, okay, it's going too long. All right. And, uh, you know, we'll check in in a little bit. So whoever wants to be first. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, Dwayne. Now you come up. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good. I'm doing good. How are you doing? What's your name? My name is Skylar, Skylar Sorensen. Hi, Skylar. All right, so I've been studying here a few years now, and just hearing you just barely say that the things you know you don't learn in film school or you know that you just learn on the set in that crisis management, um, what would you say some of the biggest things that you did take from film school are? And if you went back, what's maybe something you'd do different? <laughs> as far as, you know, what, what we need to be doing here while we're studying. <laughs> you know, man, that is it. That's a brilliant question. Um, okay, what did I learn? What did I learn? Okay. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I know there's something. <laughs> um, um, fuck. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> what did I learn at film school? Okay. I, you know what? It's a, I hate to say it, but it's a kind of a negative answer to your question. Okay. What I learned at film school was that I knew nothing about acting and that acting for me, especially the kind of stories and, and, and things that interested me in terms of film, being able to communicate with the actors was the most crucial thing. I can remember on my thesis film that I went up to an actor and, and I was about to, to talk to them and literally the words would not come out of my mouth. And I was, I was terrified because I didn't know how to say what I wanted to, to them. And, and I, I made a vow right then to myself. I said, Tom, you know what? Whatever you do, you're never going to be in that position again because it was so horrible. And ultimately, I got out of film school and started studying acting. And, and that's, you know, one of the things that just really helped me in so many ways, particularly the writing. But uh, anyway, so as far as like what I actually really did learn, uh, wow. Uh, I, I'm, what can I tell you? If, if I really did have something, I would, I would say it, but clearly I don't. So that's, that's a sad comment. Cause I, I wasted about $12,000. <laughs> <laughs> And so going from uh, studying film school to then studying acting, were you studying acting as a participant or as an observer in acting? I first started as uh, an observer. One of, the, one of the guys that was in a couple of my student films was an actor, and he said, you know, and he brought me to this class. And so I sat in the back and, and uh, was just observing. And one day, this is an absolutely true story, this guy comes up and he grabs you by the shirt. He goes, hey, man, let's do a scene together. And I said, I'm not an actor. He said, come on, let's do it. And do you know the actor Chris Noth? Do you know Chris Noth? I don't know Chris Noth. Did you ever see, um, I mean, please don't hold this against me or him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things he's the most famous for is Sex in the City. He played Mr. Big in Sex in the City. He was in, he was in uh, Law and Order, Criminal Intent for a long time. Uh, anyway, he, 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 you know, he's, he's a really fine actor. Yeah. Uh, but he dragged me on stage and, and for the first, the moment that I was in front of people trying to convince them that, that what I was doing was real, uh, changed forever how I talked to an actor. And you will hear so many conflicting stories about how to deal with actors. And, and there is, there's only one real thing that you can do. And, and this lesson has, has been proven to me a thousand times. The most annoying, irritating thing that can happen on a set is when an actor starts fucking with your brain. And they do it. They will do it. And, and some of it is intentional. Some of it comes out of fear. Some of it comes out of stupidity. Some of it is, is just accidental. But as a director, you, what you have to do is never, ever, ever take it personally and treat the actor and I know this is going to sound silly to you but mm -hmm. you don't have kids do you no not yet. Okay. well keep working on that <laughs> <laughs> um this the key is treat the actor always as if they are your most loved child and that you will forgive, you will let them know that you will forgive them and, and, and accept anything in them. And if you do that, you will be amazed at what happens because they'll turn around. They'll turn around and they will, they will give you everything. If you fight them, if you criticize them, if you, if you ridicule them in front of the rest of the cast or whatever, you might as well forget it. You might as well, you know, uh, because ultimately, and I say this, your job as a director is actually a very selfish job. And what I mean by that is what ends up on film is the only thing that matters. And who's left with that? You are. Okay? The actor leaves at the end of the day. And, 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 and think about that. Let, let's take a side trip there. Let's say that an actor intentionally screws up a scene, which happens very, very frequently. What kind yeah. of a fucking idiot would do that? Th think about it. Because yeah. this actor this actor's face is going to be on the screen. So if they think they're getting back at you 
by by giving a by not taking your note or 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 giving a, a, a half-assed performance, what they're really doing is screwing themselves. The point is though, you're the one who ends up with the film. A year later, you're there in the editing room. You're you're cutting it and you're looking at this performance and you're figuring out how am I going to make this work? I didn't get what I wanted to get. When I say selfish, what I mean is while you're shooting, you kind of have to let yourself agree. And and when I say agree, what I mean is graciously and, and with, with great care for yourself, mm -hmm. do whatever you have to do to get the scene. You understand what I'm saying? That's yeah, why yeah. So, that sometimes that's why this business can make you feel a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> You see what I'm saying now? Yeah. You know, uh, Billy Wilder is. If you if you want to do any reading, read read some of the stuff that Billy Wilder talks about in terms of directing actors. It's when I read some of the things he said about how he had to deal with Marilyn Monroe, with Tony Curtis, with with some of these actors. He said at some at sometimes the the director is like a nurse, a, a fireman, uh, a therapist. Uh, 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 what else? You know. And that's why you go home at the end of the night exhausted, because because every actor on in your set, you know, demands a different kind of persona from you. Uh, but nonetheless, the more you can just allow yourself to do that and not fight it, mm -hmm. right? don't get pissed off. <laughs> you know, uh, the better off you're going to be. Awesome. Thank you Thank so you much. Right, yeah. man. Great. Good luck Thank to you. you. I appreciate Great. it. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. My name's Nick. Hey, Nick. I had a question about the differences you've experienced with directing television versus the, the six films that you've directed as well. What, what have you noticed that's very different between the two and things that you've carried over between different kinds of projects? What I've noticed is that when I direct television, I have to either be completely drunk or I have to slit my wrist in order to do it. <laughs> um, that goes without exception. I'm sorry. There may be a few people, if they ever see this, they may say, hey, you know, I fucking hired you. Why are you saying that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the difference, listen, there is good TV. There's no question about it. There's good TV. However, the difference is, and I'm going to talk just about aesthetically for a second, and then I'll get into some of, because it's a good question. It's a good question. Listen, if you're going to work in, in, in film today, you need to be able to branch out and do film and do TV and do different things. Uh, however, you know, Come from where I came from, what was the biggest shock for me coming just from the, the, the sensibility that I'm the one who made the decisions, not that I was the dictator, that, that it was the complete opposite of that. What I'm saying is that the, the essence of every one of my films came from me. Uh, I, it, it, you know, uh, in, you know, I got the help of some incredibly talented people to help me, but I chose those people. Together we did, you know, if there was ever a crisis, we all came together and we talked about it and we said, okay, now what do we do? Uh, the, the creative freedom was, was amazing, you know, and, you know, th that's what I can tell you. And there is, oh man, if I, if anything I could just simply say to you tonight is that if you had a choice between money and creative freedom, I would always, always, always take the freedom, always. The money will screw you up. It always, always does. Now you could get lucky, you know. Some people get lucky and they they get money and they get stars and they make a, they make the movie somewhat the way they want to make it. But mm -hmm. if you really want to make your own movie, there's only one way to do it, and that's just do it the way you feel like doing it. Uh, and you'd be surprised. Maybe you won't be. And how it's just a natural impulse for everybody to tell you what you should do different. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So 
that was my biggest shift when I went into TV. I mean, I'm, I remember the first uh, script conference that I sat in on, um, you know, as a director, and everybody sits around and reads the script, and and the writers were there. Everybody was there, about 30 people sitting around this table. And I, it was quiet for a second. I said, you know, on page uh, 15, uh, there's a couple of words here that don't quite go together. I mean, it might be better said if you did this, this, and this. There was dead silence in the room. Dead silence. And finally, the producer turned to me and goes, Tom, we don't really care about your, your writing suggestions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, television is a communal effort. The director, most of the time, is at the bottom of the totem pole. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, I've done, I've done some some network TV. I just did a, a, a series for Netflix, which was, was actually really, really great. Um, it was a very different experience for me. But once you turn it in, you know, you're done with it. And they can do, they can legally do whatever they want to it. They can, they can take your cut, throw it out. They can reshoot scenes and, and, and cut them in. Um, uh, you know, listen, I, one of the reasons why I did it was because, you know, the, the, the length between each film getting a little longer. And so, you know, there's certain requirements, which is somehow eating something. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I've, I've done a few of it. Uh, if I had my, listen, if, if I really could tell you right now, completely honestly, uh, would I rather, would I, you know, would I be okay not doing TV again? I'd be okay not doing TV again. Nice. Well, thank you. All right, man. But you should do it. No, I'm okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Liz. Hey, Liz. Um, I was wondering, I was under the impression that you had a creative writing background before you went to film school, is that correct? Yes, it is, yes. So did you know that you wanted to go into film school when you began your creative writing process, or was that kind of just a branch that naturally extended that way? Well, it goes back to what Duane says, completely by accident. Uh, I, I was hearing a little feedback there, but now it's gone, so that's good. Um, I, my father was in the Marine Corps, and, and as a result, I moved around to a lot of small towns all over America, never really settled anywhere, especially never in any big cities. So my, my you know, involvement with film was very limited. Um, and so it wasn't until I went to college that someone said to me, hey, why don't you join this, this or come, you know, come to this film class and, and you know they, they were showing screenings at, at night and I was like okay wow uh, and the first film they showed was La Strada by, by Fellini have you seen that film I have not oh, I, I, I'm, I'm a first year film student okay. All right. well, <laughs> yeah. just right the, the only thing I'll say to you is just know that there are films older than 1997 that are pretty <laughs> Okay. I know. I'm looking into them. This is going to take some <laughs> No, you'd be surprised. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, I, when I say that, that I made Living in Oblivion in 1995, they went, when? And a lot of people weren't even born then. Um, okay. I, the first film I saw was La Strada, and I went, oh, my God. The, what happened was that for the first time, I saw a film telling a story uh, in ways that didn't make me feel like I had to give myself a lobotomy in order to enjoy the film, okay? Uh, the, the writing, the acting, the, the idea that, that, that film could be as engaging uh, intellectually and artistically as, let's say, a great novel or a great piece of music. Uh, and the power of film really became clear to me. And I really do think there's a reason why film is the art form of our time because it is one of the most powerful uh, and and so once I saw that I said wow uh, what you know what am I gonna do and and you know here I had this degree in creative writing I had no idea what I was gonna do with it 
And, and at that point, there was no such thing as independent film. There was nothing. There was no Sundance. There was nothing. And, and uh, I went to the, to the library in the college that I was going to and looked up film schools. <laughs> 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 and uh you know i saw nyu graduate film and i said well that looks interesting and 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 you know that was my decision was to was to try i thought that going to a film school would be would be helpful and so to go back to the other person or Dwayne, you know, no it wasn't Dwayne. it was the, the other guy the first guy's question what i did learn at film school was the necessity of working with people that actually became very clear to me uh you, you so so there that was a benefit you know the idea of working with your classmates working working with your team to somehow you know make a film uh became very very important anyway you know that's how i got into film so when you i know that you submitted different things to sundance institute to get different you know, startings and things. So what made you decide to submit Living in Oblivion to the... Well, they had already, they had already accepted, and you're not going to believe this story, but Johnny Suede premiered uh, in, in the United States uh, at the Toronto Film Festival. And it got a very good response there. That's where Miramax... Did you know that, that the Weinstein Company used to be called Miramax? No. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. They were, I mean, for independent filmmakers, Miramax was this huge company that was so important to, they distributed Hub, 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 Reservoir Dogs, all these very, very big independent films. Harvey Weinstein was the head of that company. He bought Johnny Suede at Toronto. While I was at Toronto, two guys from Sundance came up to me and said, we'd like to have you show the film at Sundance. And I said, Forget it. I don't want to go there. <laughs> because, <laughs> because at the time, this is true. This is very true. At the time, Sundance was known as the Granola Festival. <laughs> <laughs> it was. They showed films about people living out in the country and, and <laughs> chopping wood and, and kind of seeing mystical things in the water and the clouds and <laughs> repairing their relationships that way. <laughs> um, and so I resisted it. I was, and finally I said, well, okay, you know, what the hell? Um, and I went, I went with, with Johnny Sway. Um, I can tell you that it was my first experience. There was awful. The film, uh, no one got the film. No one got, it. uh, so I made living in oblivion and, and, uh, I said, well, what the heck, let me try again. And I submitted it to them and they said, sure, we'll take it. And, and it was a kind of a rare thing because usually when you apply to a festival with a film as a first time filmmaker, they don't take your next film uh, in competition. Uh, they usually sort of give you another slot somewhere else. But in this case, they took Living in Oblivion in competition. And uh, the experience there was was vastly different. And uh, you know, so uh, I, I have a lot of affection for that festival, actually. So you said that you filmed the first 30 minutes, and then once you had funding, you filmed the rest of it. Did you, how long between filming the beginning part and filming the end was the gap? No, that's a good question. It was agonizing. Uh, it was about a year. Um, and the, what was happening was that Steve Buscemi was becoming hugely popular. Dermot Mulroney at the time was, was very popular as well. And each of them, and Catherine was getting offers. So I was terrified that I was going to lose my cast. Somehow, you know, how was I going to keep these people together uh, until I got the money? Um, but it just miraculously, it came together. Uh, about a year later, we had 15 days to, oh, shoot, wow. to shoot part two and part three. Uh, part one is exists in the film literally frame for frame. It, I did no reshooting on it. it literally... <laughs> That half hour was just tacked onto the beginning, and we and we went on from there. So, how did you decide to do the soundtrack for the movie? It seems pretty thematic throughout. How did you decide to go and put that in? For living in oblivion. Yeah, for living in oblivion. Um, I became friends with a with a uh, 
a guy that I know here who's who's a kind of a playwright, painter, and and musician, and that's why I liked him, because he wasn't strictly, you know, uh, just a, a in in a box of, of, of being a composer, and um, I suggested to him a little bit of this idea, and if you ever see any Fellini films, I mean, I would highly recommend uh, seeing some of his early films because he had a composer that he worked with frequently, this guy named Nina Rota, and the music that he did for, for Fellini's films is, is in, you know, indelible. It, they, you can't see the films without thinking of the music. And so we, we stole a little bit of the idea of this Italian neorealism. And a lot of it was that you'll hear it, the vibe. There's like a, a, a marimba playing. Uh, the, it, it's interesting for a comedy, the, the music in the film is actually quite serious. It's specifically the opening music. Um, and I like that about it, but his name was Jim Farmer, uh, and we kind of sat together, talked about things. I, I would s specify where I thought music would help. Every film, when you make a film, you know, has its places of strength and its places of weakness. It's, it will always happen that way. Um, and music, listen, if you have a great scene, if you have a really, really great scene, you don't have to put any music on it. You could. You know, and make it even better if it's good music. Uh, sometimes music helps you write, literally write the film. And I don't mean by dialogue. I mean it, it can imbue a tone. It can give you a. It can, it can add an element of of uh, emotion. And I'm not talking about stupid emotions, sappies. You know, which is most of the time the way music is used. Music is completely misused in most movies. What it does is it takes what's happening right in front of you and smashes you in the face with it because you've already, you're already feeling it, you're already seeing it, and the music goes <laughs> you know? uh, Music, I love the, I, and I also think that the combination of music and film, right? A moving image with music is one of the most beautiful and, and mysterious things that 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 exists. I there's I always always have this thrill that whenever I have a section of film and I line a piece of music up with it for the first time, it, it's so exciting. I can, I can hardly wait. Now sometimes it doesn't work, but when it does work, you go, oh my god, it, it it's unbelievable. Um, and that's what I look for with working with Jim in this film was. Finding the moments where where the music could drop in, not be intrusive, not not force people to to feel a certain way, but but add this this other little element to the film. All right. Yeah, I noticed that the music was a little bit more serious. I think that added to the comedic value, though, because it kind of got you more engaged in the film. So, are you, are you a musician? Are you a musician? I'm not. Uh, I they have you take several classes of different types to make you well-rounded. So I've done audio, but that doesn't mean that I'm a musician. Right. Uh, I do respect those that are, and so I, I do pay attention to that. But thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Great question. Yes. How are you feeling, Tom? I'm doing good. How are you, Dwayne? I'm doing great. These are amazing questions, really. Yeah, these are some, some smart students we got. Hi, I'm Joe. Hey, Joe. Uh, I very much enjoyed your movie. Thanks, I man. gotta ask, um, as a director, how do you deal with people like the director of photography or any of the crew? How do you deal with them in particular about, you know, maybe you have a vision for a certain scene. How do you communicate that? Man, that is a really, really good question. And, you know, I could be glib. I could be, you know, and maybe I will later be glib and, and tell you a funny story. But but when it happens, when this, when this relationship happens between you and, let, let's take the director of photography, because I do believe that that relationship with the director is the most crucial uh, to the making of a film. It really is. This is the person that you are literally putting your life in their hands. Uh, uh, you can't stand there and say, okay, now pan here, now do this, and when he does this, do this, do this. You can't do that. Some directors do it, but it's, it just it saps something from you. So 
you know, ideally, you sit with your with your with your creative collaborator. That's the way I like to call them, and you talk about what, in the most open way, even if it's a foolish way, you talk about what you'd like to try to do with the film. Uh, I would highly recommend looking at everything that this other person has shot. Okay. Uh, I made a mistake. I made a classic mistake with Johnny Swade. I hired a, a cinematographer for my first film that I only looked at one film that, that he shot. And I was kind of going off just talking to him. I ended up having to fire this guy halfway through the film. And uh, that's that's part of the glib story. Maybe I'll tell you if, if, we, if we survive the rest of this conversation. Um, um, and if you're lucky, you know, you form, you'll, you'll sense the level of collaboration with this person. And, and that's, that's the key, key thing. And that's where your job as a director becomes really, really critical. You have to be able to start to learn how to discern, how to tell what kind of nature people have. For some reason, the film business attracts the most idiotic lunatics on the planet. The people that the people that are the most desperate need of, of you know drug therapy or you know shock therapy. They all come into the film business, okay? Uh, and they will lie to you. They're they're so skilled. They they will do whatever they can to fool you into thinking that 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 they're perfect for you and they will be your best friend and you will get the best film you'll ever get if you hire them. Okay, what you need to somehow do is to determine how much of that is bullshit because most of it is. So if you get this person, you know, look at films. That 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 that's something that I would highly recommend. Look at films. Say and, and don't say, I want it to be exactly like that. Say, look how exciting that is, or this is what I like, you know, and see if you can find the way to inspire inspire this person once they get inspired once they they get a sense of what you're after and and sense that you hired them for that specific reason to bring themselves right then they will they will love to give that okay all right that is the ideal all right sometimes it happens <laughs> sometimes that relationship happens that way as you know, you know, ego is an incredibly destructive thing. And for some reason, the director of photography is the, I would say, next to the star actor, not every actor, but the star actor, the director of, the, of photography is the person most likely to have an ego that, that, that could screw you. Okay, uh, I think sometimes it has to do with the equipment or 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 the, all the tools that they use. They, it's like they think they're 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 warriors or they're they're you know fighting a war. They're playing some sort of video game. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and it's a power trip. Um, uh, and they somehow will come to the point where where right when you need them the most, they will say. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to do something different. Um, and how you resolve that is really, you know, uh, starts to start to determine what kind of director you are. You know, um, uh, I always feel that the first thing to do is to try to discuss it and to explain clearly what you're after. If even then, after you say that and you still get this, this resistance that makes no sense to you. Uh, I think you really only have, as I was saying before, you need to be very selfish as a director, seriously. You only have one course here, and that is to, to say, listen, if you don't change, if you don't begin collaborating, then you're out of here. And you have to be able to know that as difficult as that may be, as terrifying as that may be, to let this person go, it will ultimately be better for you. Did that answer your question? It does. Um, 
I do wonder about firing people. How, mm -hmm. how is that handled? <laughs> well, it all depends on the person. It all depends on the person. I mean, listen, the person's behavior will dictate how you treat them. Like I said, your first instinct will always be to treat them diplomatically, to approach them, give them that first chance and say, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Where are we off here? How, what's going on here? What, where, where has the communication failed? Are you having a problem anywhere? Listen to them, right? If it sounds halfway believable, give them another chance. If after that second chance, they, it still happens, then you just go, do you? you? I'm telling you, let's, I cannot stress to you that when the film is over, weeks, months later, and you're there in the editing room by yourself, you're going to want to kill this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And, you know, and so to avoid that, you have to think of that. You have to think, okay, when I'm in the editing room, do I want to be thinking about killing somebody or do I want to be going, wow, that was crazy, but at least now I got the footage that I need to tell the story that I put my heart into. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, it, it, it can be funny. I, 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 listen, there are some funny aspects of this, but on the other hand, as a director, this is your thing. This is, this is the thing that you have put your soul into. And no one has the right to fuck with it. No one. And if they do, you cannot bother explaining to them how they need to develop. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a psychological thing. You cannot help somebody get to a place where they are not. And, 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 and I really, really feel this on, on a prime level, that, that when someone intentionally de, you know, destroys what you're trying to do uh, without understanding how difficult it is for you, even, for you to even get a camera on a street with film in the camera, right? That's inexcusable. And my point is, though, you don't waste your time explaining it to them. You just, you understand Okay, here's another, here's another one of the nut jobs, and you just you got to let him go. You just got to let him go. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Hey, let's do, let's do, uh, Tom, we'll do two more, all right? That sounds sounds good. good. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how are you? Doing well. My name's Scott. Um, so the question I have, so you had a line in the movie about, like, hostess, you know, like, stuffed Hollywood, right? You know, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, this tweaking motherfucker. Yeah, that. That's the line. Um, I feel like that's a huge problem with movies nowadays. Um, and everybody's become kind of film illiterate. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking to a bunch of film students, and we all want to make our own movies and um, inspire people. Uh, how do we avoid, you know, that mindset, you know? Wow. Man. <laughs> These, you know, these are really, really good questions. I'm telling you that that again is a question that could be handled glibly, but I can't handle it glibly because because ultimately it's it's it touches the core of why you do what you do, and it's what separates you from the morons, from 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 the idiots, from the from the people that should be selling zippers, you know, uh, on the subway. Okay, uh, and it comes down to that, and and you see, you see, there there are so many myths in this business, so many. One of one of the reasons why I made Oblivion was to to kind of poke a hole in in, in some of those myths. That, uh, but I'll stay with this. One one of the myths, the huge myths in the filmmaking business is that is that, you know, somehow you you get success and. And, and, and your life ends up like you're in paradise, you know, like, like, I guess, like you're in ISIS, you know, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? What the fuck? It's so stupid. You know, uh, you don't end up in paradise. Most of the time it is, it is the exact opposite of that. It's, it's, it's a constant, constant struggle to maintain your integrity, to stay, to stay honest to yourself. Uh, if that's what you want to do. Okay, I, I, I think, let me just pause for a second and say to you that, that it's entirely okay to enter this business and make a decision and say, what I'd like to do is make a shitload of money, you know, 
and 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 make the same movie you know for 20 years it's okay to do that right if you want to do something different if you want to somehow say wow this is how i'm feeling today here's what i'm going through uh i'd like to try to put that uh on film and 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 my particular vision of that uh i really believe that i'm the only person who can do that and most of the time that's true if you look at most artists most writers most painters most musicians the ones that really really stick with you are the ones who gave you their soul you understand what i'm saying now this business actually is the exact opposite of that it really is and and uh it depends how intensely you feel about which side of the pendulum you want to be on uh now i know that's a kind of a, a bullshit sort of answer but a couple of filmmakers whom i respect uh the cohen brothers the cohen brothers have made some movies that i really really uh admire uh, and then you look at some of their other films and you can tell that basically what they're doing is making a film that will help them make another movie. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, it's, it's a kind of straddling defense. It's kind of like playing the game a little bit. Um, uh, you know, that, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to is to somehow understand that, believe it or not, there are actors out there that are very talented, who are somewhat famous, and are willing to take risks on, on different films, uh, and to try to get to them. There are producers out there that feel the same way. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think that that if if you look at at some of the most solid films that that have come out of you know the last 15 or 20 years the films that people remember are the ones that started kind of small and 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 you know still somehow have a human some some kind of human element to them not the hostess twinkie crap uh but the hostess twinkie stuff is the stuff that gets all the attention right, right. Uh, it, it's amazing uh i don't know why that is it's uh it's 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 this business i mean if you go to Sundance now, uh, it's so different than when I went there the first time. Uh, there are literally boutiques all along the all along the street where where people are trying to get the star actors to come in and, and give them free products. I mean, have you heard about this? Do you know this? It's the whole idea of what is independent anymore. Is is it has no definition. Um, when I first started, and we were making films, uh, and, and you know, the idea that we would seek acceptance from Hollywood was completely—we never even thought about it. We, if anybody in our group was thinking that way, we, we you know, we all just sort of ridiculed them. Uh, right now, it's it's the opposite. I mean, if if you think about the most successful independent films. They they are they they are indistinguishable from Hollywood films, and I just think it makes the struggle harder. But I do think it you know it makes it it makes it clearer what it is that you can do. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? If if all that bullshit exists, if all that hostess Twinkie crap exists, at least it shows you that what you have, what you want to do. Uh, is different and and you know all you can do is do that and and hope that people will see it awesome, awesome. thank you so much all right man yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, is, this is it all right no other questions okay we have a we have a uh, encore <laughs> you, Tom, it takes a while to get up. I mean, it's like you know, stadium <laughs> seating out there. So I, I was waiting. No, I was going to ask because I know that you seem to write and direct films. Did you, and then you have your passions towards television. 
Is it because you didn't write? <laughs> is it because you enjoy the writing and directing combo, or would you rather just direct a film that you didn't write, or do you are you not prefer preferable to either one? Well, there again, that's a great question. Um, there there is a thrill beyond comprehension of of writing a scene, writing a film, uh, going through the whole process, getting it done, and then and then sitting in the theater and, and seeing people respond to it. I'm, I'm not talking about the, the ego gratification. I'm, I'm talking about the sense that you took this idea out of nothing, literally. It was an idea in your brain, and somehow you turned it into 97 pages that ended up somehow somebody put up some money and you – you got it on, and you got the actors to agree. And and and, but the most magical moment is when you sit in an audience and and you, you know, you see people just responding to it. It's it. I can't tell you how how gratifying that is. It's uh, it's and again, I I stress, I I don't believe that it's an egotistical thing. I think it's 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 a sense of satisfaction, a sense of of relief sometimes, but but also a sense of wonder. And I really mean that because what, for a film to actually get completed and, and into a theater is, is a miracle beyond comprehension. Uh, but I also, you know, I, there are, I'm looking at things now, uh, I, I'm, I'm think, I have a script that I'm, I'm, I'm putting together, but there are several books that, that really, really interest me in terms of like saying, well, you know, could I, could I put that together into a film? And, and of course, if, if, if I read a, a screenplay that someone had written that really, really spoke to me, uh, I, you know, I would, be, I would be open to it. Perfect. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Yes. Tom, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Sure this is very inspiring for everybody. It was very inspiring for me. Um, Tom, I met Tom through a mutual friend who's an actor, and if you watch your, his films, you'll notice how people tend to want to work with him over and over and over again. And I think that's, uh, I don't think, I think that's really obvious why. So thank you so much for sharing, and uh, everyone else give him a big round of applause. I just have to say that uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed this thoroughly, and I, am, uh, I, was, I was seriously deeply impressed by the this the the level of of thought and 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 uh, intuition that went into these questions. I, I I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I I I really admire everybody there. So thank you. Well, thank you, and I will send you this link. And uh, thank you so much for everything. All right, you have a good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.